Hey, good morning, Coffee with Brenna friends. New mug today that I borrowed from the church kitchen. I'm going to read you the back. It says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's from Isaiah 40, 31. That's a familiar passage probably to some of you. You can probably continue to, to quote it. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Very appropriate for the challenging times that we are currently living in. I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm actually going, going to share with you a teaching that I've given. It's probably one of my most given out and requested teachings. It's called Philippians 4 and God's Prescription for Anxiety. I'm going to record the whole thing. And for my Coffee with Brenna friends, I may split it up over several weeks, but I will upload the entire teaching eventually to YouTube as one unit, okay? Because unfortunately, the several times that I've given this teaching at conferences have not been recorded. So I don't have a recording of it. I'm constantly sending a PDF to people of the teaching, which may not make a ton of sense. And this is abridged. This is not the full teaching. I've cut out sections of it. But it's so important, and it even came up several times this week that I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and share it with you all. So I start off with a story. A friend of mine growing up had a dog named Samantha. Samantha was a shepherding dog. It was in her blood to round things up, like sheep or animals. That's, that's who God created this dog to be. <laughs> oh, since we know God created all things, right? But unfortunately for Samantha, the only round thing in my friend's backyard was a pool. And so Samantha, being the good shepherding dog that she was, herded that pool. Have you ever seen a dog herd animals? Literally, they run around them until they all get together in a bunch. But she ran around and around and around that pool until the force of her paws hitting the ground over and over began to form a groove in the ground. It wasn't long before Samantha's circles had dug a ditch around that pool. There had been grass, it had been nice, and now there was a ditch around the pool from Samantha's constant herding. This is what happens in our brains as we form habits, both good and bad. This is what happens in our brains when we think the same thoughts and do the same things over and over again. Okay. I heard a speaker once describe a similar occurrence in how and why we struggle with ongoing negative thought patterns. Basically, when you think the same negative thoughts, when you have believed for so long that you are worthless and life is hopeless and you will always be depressed and anxious, neural pathways are formed in your brain. Now, I don't claim to be a scientist. Most of you know I have a bachelor in music, actually. <laughs> I went to a music conservatory that didn't even have any science classes, okay? There were 750 students there and no science. Um, but the way it's been explained to me is that neural pathways are like that initial groove that Samantha created when she began to round run around the pool. Now, initially it was very, very, very um, shallow and narrow. And initially you wouldn't have even been able to see it. But with each continued thought and habit, that neural pathway was deepened. As this happens, something called a myelin sheath is formed around that neural pathway. And every time we think those thoughts or do those behaviors, not only does the neural pathway grow stronger, but the myelin sheath reinforces it over and over again. Okay. Um, put another way, uh, when you when you develop these deep, high quality neural pathways with the thick myelin sheaths, you can actually bypass conscious thought and and for instance perform fine motor skills faster, more accurately, and more precisely under stress. It's kind of like muscle memory. Um, when you start driving a stick shift, I can drive a stick shift. My father always drove one and therefore so did I. Um, 
I don't have to think about putting the clutch down. I don't have to remind myself to do that. For those of you who don't know how to drive a stick shift, you probably know that they have that, uh, you know, a standard transmission has a stick, has a, a stick shift that you have to move and not just put it in D. You probably know there's a clutch, but you don't know what to do with those things. If you got in my car, you would have to consciously think and have someone teach you how to do that. But for those with of us who've driven it, I'm 44 years old, soon to be 45. I've been driving a stick ship since I was 17. I don't have to think about it. And that's what these, these neural pathways are like. It's, mus it's a type of muscle memory. The same is true of your thought patterns. <sighs> Have you ever experienced what an outsider might view as a minor negative comment, but yet suddenly you're plunged into the depth of despair? Or suddenly you're, you're, or have you ever acted out and not understood, how did I get here? What happened to even get here? Well, this is because the slightest negative trigger sends you straight down that negative neural pathway roller coaster. And we're going to talk later about, yes, you can get off that roller coaster. That groove in your brain has been so well worn by Samantha running around the pool or by, in this case, your past negative experiences that with one small negative input, even if it's just your perception that it's negative, that negative thought becomes like a metal ball rolling downward on the slope of a pinball machine into a lake full of, I told you so, why did you bother trying? It always ends up this way. Panic, panic, panic. You're not going to be able to handle this situation. Why did you think you could change? Does that sound familiar to anybody besides me? <laughs> Maybe you've recognized these tendencies in yourself. You've read in scripture that God can transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's Romans 12 too. You've tried to think better thoughts, but you seem to keep falling into that roller coaster of emotions. Why is that? Because when we try to form new pathways with truth, just like those initial pathways that we formed many years ago for some of us, they're like floppy noodles. You know, we made spaghetti last week. Our noodles are extra floppy because we're gluten-free, okay? But everyone knows before you cook the spaghetti, you could poke someone's eye out with that thing, and then you cook it, and it's a floppy noodle. Well, the deep neural pathways are like the spaghetti before you cook it. And when you're trying to form new thoughts, they're like spaghetti after you cook it compared to the negative thoughts that you have imprinted in your brain. The more you reinforce that new belief, however, the stronger that floppy noodle becomes. It's like the opposite of cooking. It's becoming uncooked. A new neural pathway will form. Yes, it will form. And eventually a strong myelin sheath around that neural pathway. The reason this takes time is because that strong negative thought pattern or habit and its strong myelin sheath, the sheath of the negative thought will fade away and break down over time as you stop reinforcing it. And as you start reinforcing that positive or true thought, okay? Unfortunately, this one never goes away. But Around the pool, there may also always be evidence that Samantha went to town, okay? But if she stops running around the pool, it will fade and fade and fade. The grass will grow back. Does that make sense? All right. So something that also impacts this. I heard a teaching years ago on trauma, and I have not been able to connect with the person who um, gave the teaching, but she, this, this also goes along with something my counselor used to tell me when we experience anxiety prior to being able to read or write, or some people say even age three, some people say a little older, we don't possess the ability to store memories in our brain cognitively as words or language. We store sensations and images. 
So trauma can be stored in our bodies as sensations and images. There's a book that, um, that uh, I'm going to write it down so I remember to tell you. The Body Keeps the Score. I have not read it, but I've heard so many people reference it. Your body stores that. And I tell the story of when I first started seeing my, my, la my last really awesome Christian counselor. I think it was 2001. She gave me a depression and anxiety uh, assessment. Now I knew I was depressed. I had no question, but I told her, I don't have, I don't have anxiety. You know, it's not an issue for me. And <clears throat> took the depression. It was mild to moderate. And I took the anxiety assessment. Now, this was a long time ago, so I can't even tell you what was on there. But I scored extremely high. And that's because I didn't have conscious anxiety, but my body... <laughs> Even the sensations I had, and I had had some panic attacks, but not very many, but it was clear that I had a lot of anxiety um, because my home growing up was an anxious home. And those things happened before I could put words to them. Here's something else that impacts our ability to, to change the way we think, to allow God to change the way we think, because that's what Romans 12, 2 says. Satan knows your weaknesses. And he will continue to try and use it against you. That doesn't mean you aren't growing and changing and making progress. It just means that floppy noodle of a neural pathway needs time to be reinforced. It needs time to overcome. It's almost as if, have you ever learned to do something wrong? I share this... Um, I share this in my book, Learning to Walk in Freedom. Um, and in physical therapy, I had to reinforce muscles I didn't even know I had and didn't know I needed to use because my body had compensated for an injury and used muscles that weren't meant to be used for walking for walking. Okay? And imagine if you have one leg longer than the other. Your body compensates for that. And if you have surgery to fix it, you're going to need to relearn how to walk. And that's what we're doing here. We use those negative thought patterns as coping mechanisms and reinforce them and reinforce them and reinforce them. And now we have to relearn not how to walk in this case, but how to think. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Now, let me tell you something. I call this God's prescription for anxiety. And I don't say that because I am anti-counseling or anti-medication or anything like that. That is not the case at all. So what this, what me sharing this is and isn't, I am not saying all anxiety is spiritual or can be fixed by scripture. I need to say that extremely clearly. Okay. I am saying God's word has help for this. And we should take it, right? There are lots of forms of help we can take, right? When you have when you have a baby, you might need someone to come and play with your older kids while you snuggle or nurse or feed the baby, right? You might need someone else to bring over some meals. You might need someone else to come do some dishes for you. Those are different kinds of help. And one help for anxiety is spiritual. There's no question about that in my mind. I am not anti-medication or anti-counseling. I am a lay person. Like I said, Bachelor of Music, I'm not a doctor. There are clinical condition, conditions, issues with brain chemistry that require medication. I. Some of you think less of me because I said that, and some of you are sighing a big sigh of relief. Different types of help for one issue. Get the help you need whether it's spiritual or physical, our food, exercise. There's so many things that can impact our level of anxiety. Let's, let's address this from all the angles at which it needs to be addressed, okay? That's what I'm saying here. So even if you have anxiety that needs to be controlled with medication, you can still find help in Philippians 4, which is what we're going to talk about, okay? What's, what I'm doing here is I'm adding another tool to your toolbox. It's just another tool in your toolbox. Because anxiety can trigger us 
to act out, to be suicidal, to self-soothe, to question God's goodness. And that's why Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these verses in Philippians 4. Okay? Paul actually gives us a step-by-step program for dealing with our anxious thoughts. So a little bit of context here. Paul is writing from prison, okay? Philippi, the the letter is called Philippians because it was written to the people of Philippi, was a Roman colony where there were very few Jews, but lots of retired military men. And this is important. This will come into play later. Um, It's important to know that Paul knew his audience. Uh, He knew his audience here. I'm pulling from a lot of sources in this teaching. There's a commentary called the Tyndale Commentary. Matthew Henry is a favorite. I've mentioned him here before. Oswald Chambers, the InterVarsity Press um, commentary, New Bible, I believe, commentary. I try to mention a source if I'm quoting it directly, and I'm not going to link to all those sources here. So um, just just letting you letting you know about that, okay? So let's dig right into scripture, and I'm you're going to see the scripture pop up on the screen for you there, okay? We're starting in Philippians 4, verse 6, and I believe we're going through verse 9 here. So verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Okay, anxious, which is usually translated do not worry or do not be concerned. In the Greek, it also implies do not expend careful thought, concern oneself with, or have your thoughts occupied with this. In the Phillips commentary, it says, um, our requests are known to God already, yet he loves to hear us ask. I've been having a conversation with a friend about when your child speaks his or her first words, You don't expect them to speak in full sentences. You're just so happy to hear their little voice, right? And that's the same thing that's going on here. You may feel super awkward. Maybe you've never really prayed out loud. Pray out loud. God just loves to hear your voice. It can be super awkward. And he's like, oh, listen, that's my little beloved. I love to hear her voice. I love to hear him talk to me. Okay. Prayer makes the do not be anxious about anything part possible. Now, I could go into the different um, why Paul uses basically three um, words to talk about prayer. Prayer, petition, present requests. They all have slightly different connotation. One means general prayer. One means more please and urgent please. We need urgent please right now, right? Many Many of us feel very anxious about what's going on in the world. But all of these things are important. But the most important part, well, there isn't a most important part. There's two things going on here. Pray and give thanks. Pray and give thanks. Pray and give thanks. Okay, Thanksgiving is an important component, accompaniment of true prayer. I talk in um, in my blog about Stones of Remembrance. I'll link that here. I keep a list of stones of remembrance in the back of my journal, and some of them are silly, but they're just little touch points where I can see that God has been faithful. Like one says, Maggie got a fever but was only sick for a day and a half and was able to go to a class that she was concerned about um, missing, a class she was concerned about missing, and some of them are bigger, you know, um, things that God did for friends that I was concerned about. Uh But they're reminders to me that God has been faithful in the past and he's going to be faithful again. So that's the thanksgiving that I think of when I read this. Um, Oswald Chambers says, when every time we pray, our horizon is altered, our attitude to things is altered, not sometimes, but every time. And the amazing thing is that we don't pray more. Last week, we talked about worship over worry. That's another way to attack our anxiety is through worship. But prayer, prayer, a very familiar song says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So every verse has an action step. 
when I share this teaching. So the action step here is when anxiety comes for verse six, pray first, pray first. Include those specific prayer, prayer requests. Include with that thanksgiving, reminding ourselves of God's faithfulness in the past. So here's an example. God, wow, I really feel anxious about fill in the blank. Our blank would probably be COVID-19 right now. But I thank you, God, that I am never alone. Just like a mother cannot forget the child she has birthed, that's from Isaiah 49, you don't forget or leave me. In fact, I'm written on the palm of your hand. So God, help me now as you promised to do in my time of need, as I boldly approach your throne, like it says in Hebrews 4.16. Give me the grace I need to walk through this. So verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the action step, when anxiety comes, pray first, include thanksgiving. Pray first, include thanksgiving. On to verse 7. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is a promise. Peace is a promise. It's been given already, just like freedom and sanctification, but it's something we need to receive we need to cultivate, we need to walk in it, and allow it in, in order for it to do its work in us. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Not, let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Peace is a given. Fearful and troubled hearts are something we allow. Peace is something that has to be received. A gift is always something that has to be received. Jesus left us with peace. He gave us peace, but we have to take it in, receive it, make it our own. It says, the peace transcends all understanding. Um, Tyndale says that's beyond the range of our comprehension. It doesn't make sense, but peace is able to transcend those negative neural pathways. But we can let peace rule rather than letting anxiety rule. Now, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul used this term because the Philippians lived in a garrison town. Like I said, there were lots of retired military, but there were active military. This is a town that has troops permanently stationed in it. Constantly, these people knew the meaning of guards. They constantly had guards, right? But it will, this peace will guard like it's a, it's like a boundary. It's like a barrier around our hearts and minds, not just one or the other, the heart, which is the seat of feeling and the mind, which is the seat of understanding. So what is our verse seven, which is in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is our action step? Receive peace. Okay, receive God's peace. We pray, God, let me receive your peace. Jesus said he left us with peace. Help me to take it in and live out of that reality rather than the reality of my anxious thoughts. Verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I feel like Paul was covering all of his bases here. True, noble, pure, right, lovely, admirable, anything excellent or praiseworthy. Okay? Now, Cy Rogers talks about this concept of a however off-ramp. And so we have this neural pathway. We have this deep neural pathway and something triggers us. Okay? And we find ourselves going down that familiar path of thought or behavior. You can take an however off-ramp. For instance, it could be something like this. Wow, that article I read on the internet about COVID-19 was so triggering to me. I am so scared right now. I feel just panicked and I want to self-medicate. In the past, I would turn to fill in the blank. Pornography, food, suicidal thoughts, hopelessness. Hopelessness was a big one for me. Food is still a big one for me. However, okay, so you, instead of continuing in the direction of those thoughts, we create a however off ramp. And again, it's going to be floppy noodle at the beginning, but however, I choose to believe you, God, and not everything I read on the internet. I choose to believe that God loves me and I can turn to him for comfort 
rather than a broken, sinful coping mechanism. And when Paul says finally here, it's more like, and so. Let's wrap this up. Let's, let's get to the heart of this. Furthermore, henceforth, remainder. This is the logical conclusion of what we have shared. The interesting thing about this passage is it's often split up verse 6 and 7 and verse 8. And verse 9 is left off. So it's verse 6 and 7. And then a separate thing, verse 8. No, this is one passage. That's why I love looking at it in its entirety. Think about this. Don't think about that. Don't reinforce those already strong neural pathways. Let's build some new ones by thinking about other things. And I'm not going to go through and explain every one of these terms in Greek and what they mean. Um, I'm just going to say, I'm going to go with true here. Okay. And um, I shared something on my Instagram, which automatically goes to my Facebook page um, this, uh, this week, something from Bob Hamp. And now I, I went online and I, I mean, I went to the book and I found the real, the full quote. Bob Hamp says this, I am convinced that our feelings will always tell us the truth, not necessarily the truth about reality, but the truth about what we believe. Okay. I shared it because a lot of people will say your feelings lie to you. And Bob Hamp correctly says your feelings may not tell you what is real, but they'll tell you the truth about what you believe. So how do we, how do we combat that with truth, big T? This is the foundation of it all. Is it true? Does it rip courage out of you or deposit courage into you? Does it make you want to cling to Jesus or does it make you want to run? Does it, would you say it to a friend or a child? And most importantly, is that what Jesus says about you? Does it line up with the word of God? And the only way I figured this out was to memorize scripture, to memorize scripture. Now you have a, a phone that you carry around with you 24 seven, right? When I was doing this 20 plus years ago, I had a little like notepad of scriptures and I actually memorized them. I think I'm glad there wasn't a phone. I'm glad that barely anyone was using Bible Gateway or I didn't have a computer I could carry around with me with the scripture because I still know it. I could still quote so many of those verses to you. The things I had to memorize about hope, about trust, about clinging to Jesus in order to get through every day. We could, we can, we could, I could do a whole thing on this and I probably should talk about how to think like a free person in a separate video, but whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, all the bases that he's covered, think about those things. He's count, calculate, set your mind on these things. The action step, God, turn my thoughts to truth. Turn my thoughts to truth. That's your action step. God, Turn my thoughts to truth. And then quote the scriptures that you've memorized or carry on an index card or on your phone. Turn my thoughts to truth, such as, think about such things. Verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the peace of God will be with you. Going back to that peace will guard your hearts. But he's covering all his bases. Did you learn it from me? Did you receive it from me? Did you hear it from me? Did you see it in me? Put it into practice. Not because Paul was the end all be all, but Tyndale says before the composition of the New Testament and its acceptance as authoritative scripture, the standard of Christian belief and behavior um, was embodied in the teaching and example of those persons in whose lives the authority and ethical practice of the Lord was to be found. Wow, that was long. I should consolidate that for you. They they didn't have a Bible like this. They had a letter from Paul. <laughs> they had this letter. And of course they had the Old Testament. But basically what it's saying is the standard for how we should live was in a person that they looked up to me. In another place in scripture, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. It's not like be like Paul, but like I'm following Jesus. Let's go go after him together, okay? What is our, sorry, what is our action step? 
do it. Do it again and again and again and again and again. And as you do it again and again and again and again and again, that floppy noodle is reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. Till those new thoughts, those true thoughts, those positive thoughts, those life-giving thoughts are come as naturally to you as the hopeless, worthless thoughts did, negative thoughts did. So we do it again and again and again. Read the scripture. Read the whole oh, Philippians. My One of the um, pastors at my church was saying Philippians is a great book to read during a time like this. Paul was in prison. He was in house arrest in Rome, is my understanding. He was shackled to guards. He was writing this from what could have been an extremely tense and anxious situation. He was living it. Let's live it, okay? Let's live it too. Um, so let me pray for you. Jesus, we are very grateful for your help, your prescription for dealing with anxiety, your help amidst lots of helps, one tool in the toolbox, but a very important tool. I will not minimize that, Lord. I will not minimize that your scripture, that your word has help for today, uh, help for the situations we are facing, help for the anxiety in the world. I pray for my dear friends who are watching this video, Lord God, that whatever is true, they would think about. Whatever is pure, that they would allow your peace to guard their hearts, Lord God, hearts and minds, that they would pray and in the midst of their prayer, give thanks because you have been faithful in the past and you will be again. God, you did not jump off the throne when COVID-19 came on, you know, came about on this planet. You did not jump off the throne. Maybe that's not the primary worry in your life right now. Maybe you have a loved one diagnosed with cancer or someone who's having mental health issues, whatever it might be. Maybe food is scarce for you right now. Still, God, you're sitting on the throne. You are still sovereign. You are still faithful. You are still good. Help us to choose to trust you in the midst of whatever we're facing today. And help us to put this into practice. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, everyone. See you next week.